Okay, well, welcome everyone. Uh, we're meeting today uh, in this podcast with uh, Gordon Garan, and the subject is self-balancing, uh, self-balancing production lines in particular, and this is something that uh, we at the Leonardo Group have been interested in for, you know, it's really going on decades now, this idea of uh, running a production line in a non-traditional kind of way and getting some really powerful and interesting advantages uh, to doing that. And uh, before we get Gordon in to, uh, to contribute, I thought I'd just give you a little background on how we met, which was fairly recently. I was uh, doing some research on LinkedIn, uh, looking for people who actually shared our core, say our, our core focus, uh, which was mixed model line design, mixed model material management, mixed model line design. So I was just searching on the term mixed model, and Gordon's name came up kind of at the, near the top of the list. And so I clicked on his profile, and I zeroed right in on the fact that he'd written a book. Uh, it's sort of a longer title, but basically it's uh, Self-Balancing Processes. It's the main part of that title. And I thought, hmm, this sounds really uh, intriguing. So I think pretty much right away I just, I just clicked on the link there, or I went right to Amazon and was able to find, find his book there and, and bought it. It's available in, is it paperback or hardback? and Kindle, so I was able to get the Kindle version right away. So if you'd like to get that after this podcast is over, go, uh, go get that for you uh, on Amazon, and maybe uh, Gordon can share with us if there's some other place you can go, but Amazon is, uh, just search on the terms self-balancing in books, and I think it, it'll come right up. I think it was the third on the list. I did this right before our phone call, so very easy to find, and you can purchase it there or, or download it. So that is, uh, that's how we got started. So I read, I read the book, and I actually contacted Gordon, sent him a message through LinkedIn, and said, hey, uh, once I finish reading the book, uh, and so I know a little bit about what you were talking about or what we, we could talk about, I'll, I'll give you a call. And I did. And we had a, a good discussion a few days ago, and I thought this would be a great um, topic for a podcast as well to share with our, both of our audiences on this issue of self-balancing. So... Uh, with that, I think we'll just bring Gordon in here. He's on the line. Gordon, you there? I am here. Can you uh, hear me? Yep. Sounds great. So uh, great. Be before we get into this, uh, the, the, the approach to self-balancing that you present in the book, and by the way, the book is, is a fairly easy read, so uh, I, was, I was grateful for that as well. You know, very clear, very well written, and easy to get through. But before we get into that concept of self-balancing, let's set the stage for uh, listeners in terms of what the what the uh, option might be uh, and I'm not talking about traditional manufacturing even in the world of lean right in the world of lean manufacturing uh, what would be maybe help 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 out the listeners a little bit in terms of describing what the traditional what you might call Toyota production system or level loaded uh, environment might look like uh, sure yeah I think uh, still being mostly taught in industrial engineering and so forth is uh, what yeah, we can call level loading and it probably started with Henry Ford uh, trying to balance the work content of each worker in an assembly line mostly um, so that uh, there's as little waiting as possible and um, kind of slicing and dicing the work elements to do that it's a little, gets a little convoluted um, but out of the automotive industry with a a paste or conveyed line, it was it was mandatory because the car's in front of everybody for the same amount of time. So um, that's really how it started. Um, yet uh, most manufacturing I've been involved in, a lot of people, is not on a paste line. It's manual, manually transferred. So, um, but nonetheless, the level loading aspect has been followed as the you know paradigm for for line balancing. Okay, and I mean that's that's what I learned, uh, that, and that's what more or less what we teach, right? And that's kind of considered state of the art. So you take a work content and you try to balance it to the number of workstations that you need, right, to achieve a certain desired throughput, yep. right, output. Yeah. And uh, the other thing maybe to uh, to emphasize is that within the Toyota model or within the you know that 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 way of thinking. Uh, a lot of emphasis is put is put on 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 level loading the work and getting people to kind of adhere to that in order to reduce variation, right? In, reduce 
uh, waiting time or block time. So the closer and closer you can get to actually having people work that way, the better the line's going to run, correct? Right, absolutely. Um, you do, you know, the best job you can on paper. You do the best job, you know, reducing variation. Um, and, uh, you know, hopefully get better over time. Um, but um, nonetheless, there, there's, there always is some variation. Um, and there's different ways to buffer or, um, you know, balance against that. Um, and there's, you know, there's evidence in most assembly lines that the line is not perfectly balanced either in buffers or you just observed um, uh, waiting time for some or, or many of the operators. Yeah, video, uh, I mean, if you've ever uh, taken a video recording of a line in action, uh, it's not unusual at all to see just a, almost a, sometimes a shocking amount of waiting, uh, especially if that line's fully staffed, so there's no place for people to go, and, you know, you, right. you, you do your little slice of work, and unless things are flowing very well, then almost invariably there's some kind of delay and waiting, and that's kind of what we're talking about here with the subject of trying to address that issue, right, address that problem. Yeah, and, and there's another waste that I discovered uh, that you is harder to see and almost impossible to see sometimes is what I call self-pacing. So if you know just you ended up with less work content and you're going to be, um, you kind of have some design in waiting at your station, if you will. So you, you got uh, a, it's you, natural. You, you got a good workstation, right? <laughs> yeah. Little, yeah, you less, got the lucky one. Yeah. It's natural to stretch it out a little bit, self-pace yourself so, you know, the average operator doesn't like to be seen idle, uh, doesn't like to put pressure on the downstream person, doesn't like to keep em emptying that in-process queue. Um, so they'll, they'll just slow down, and you can't see that. So there's, there's a lot of that very hidden waste um, that uh, um, is usually not talked about, but it's, it's real. Yeah, I, I suppose if you do that, too, you just add to the problem because not only are you consuming all the time allotted to you, but if you're wrong part of that time, now, now you're creating additional delay on either side of you. You know what I mean? Right. I mean, it's one thing to right. be waiting, but now, now if you stretch out your time and you don't make your tag time, now you're making other people wait on you without reason. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And then you weren't a bottleneck, and now you're a bottleneck. <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the other thing maybe we could touch on uh, that I know you talked about in your book uh, in this traditional environment is the kind of the psychological aspect of teamwork or lack thereof, you know, in that kind of environment. Sure. When sure. I, We've all heard some of the, you know, kind of nightmare stories out of uh, some of the overseas manufacturing where it's uh, essentially a bit of a sweatshop and the work conditions are not unlike they were 100 years ago. Um, in some of our factories where it's very monotonous, um, it's not very dignified, to be quite frank, um, and the lack of variety um, is, you know, has high, ends with higher turnover rates, possible um, quality issues, you know, due to daydreaming or disinterest or whatever. Um, so, so essentially the you know, in the, in the larger scale, the social aspect of, of that type of work environment has, has been a problem uh, for 100 years. Right, and if you're, do, if you're just doing your chunk of work, then the kind of the need to communicate with your fellow operators in the line is, is less, right? Be, I mean... Yeah, it's, it's um, you know, we talk about silos and lean and breaking them down, and it's, it's essentially silos of each person's work. I've seen people work with headphones, um, no communication, they set up what I call a factory condo with decorating their little station and pictures of the family and so yeah. forth. My the school, the, the my of, turf. The, the Virgin of Guadalupe in Mexico, right there. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, so, yeah, the, not um, lending itself to team, um, just teamwork throughout the day. It's really, I do my bit and I pass it on, and uh, you do your bit and you pass it on. Okay. So I think that that's a good uh, introduction. So people have a sense. I mean, it's not, it's not terrible. I mean, certainly that way of working is light years ahead of 
uh, say, single station build or unbalanced lines or, <laughs> you know, there are a lot of ways you could do it a lot worse than that. But uh, Absolutely. But uh, now we're talking about, let's get into uh, this uh, brave new world of self-balancing uh, and, sure. and really what, what that could mean. Uh, and, and by the way, the, the, the reason we're especially interested in this, or I'm especially interested in this, is we had our approach to self-balancing, which is a little different from uh, what Gordon has presented. I think uh, mm -hmm. both, both maybe have their pros and cons. We won't get into to ours, but certainly it's something that in its essence we've been looking at for a long time, and that is how could you set up the line? I'm kind of giving a high-level uh, definition of this. How could you set up a production line so that if people don't have work in front of them, because they've completed it so sooner, for example, that there would be some other way that they could continue to add value, right? And and if you can do that, mm -hmm. then your productivity is going to go way up. Uh, you had some 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 big productivity potential productivity gains that you mentioned in your book. I think you said 30 percent it would be not out of the picture or more, right? Or even higher than that. Uh, and yeah, then, actually, go yeah, ahead. 30 percent has been the minimum that we've gotten when converting a line. So pretty. Pretty, uh, pretty big changes. Yeah, that, that's huge. And then the other mm -hmm. thing, the other thing is this idea that we just talked about with uh, the culture and the communication. You know, can we do things to uh, widen people's, uh, uh, you know, uh, human human potential by mm -hmm. by by challenging them, challenging them a little bit more, but also uh, having them work as a uh, as a team uh, in a more intense kind of way, and really improve people's working life. I think at the same time that we're improving sure. productivity. Yep. Okay. So um, when I discussed this with you the other day, the way I pictured your self-balancing concept in my mind, coming from kind of a more traditional uh, self-balance, you know, more traditional um, level loading point of view, mm -hmm. was I pictured I pictured a workstation instead of say uh, to keep it simple uh, a three-person cell. What I pictured in my mind was one workstation shared by three people and kind of organized so that one person would do a piece of the work and another person would do the middle, say the middle third more or less, and then the third person would do the last third more or less, but uh, without the strict boundary that we often have in a, you know, in a, in a level loaded kind of environment, so that, I, so that each person would still have a kind of a primary job, uh, although there's nothing to keep them from switching, swapping, but primary job, but uh, as required by the workflow, be able to move and overlap with the other people's uh, work. So did I describe that? Maybe you can clarify exactly how, how that would work. Or say it your own way. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so probably uh, a good way to describe it is if you took your entire assembly line and uh, let's say just for the sake of discussion, it was a three-person line. Yeah. And you um, definitely took away any barriers or zones or boundaries, but essentially set up the entire assembly line hypothetically as if one person was going to build one part start to finish and just progress down the line, either how the parts are and tools are presented. I call it horizontal part and tool presentation as you move down the line. Um, as, so if one person were to progress down the line um, and they were cross-trained, again, this is hypothetical, of course they wouldn't set the part down in between any one step or another, but you would just arrange the entire line um, as such. So a one, I would say a one-person line is always balanced, right? You don't wait for yourself. <laughs> right, right. Um, okay. So the challenge is when you add uh, two or more people. So um, I'm actually in the process of moving. So let's say uh, not an assembly line, but let's say I'm you know moving a box from uh, you know my current residence into a moving van, which is out the street, and I'm walking that whole distance by myself. And then I go back and I get another box, and I walk back and I load it in the truck. Now, if a second person comes to help me, they could you know we could work in parallel. Or what if like they grab the box, and then when I loaded one, I would come, and they're walking down towards me. I grab that box from them, and I go and put it in the truck, and they head back into the place. 
you get the next box, and now we're kind of a like a bucket brigade, bucket brigade, if you will. Yep. And you can see you can add a third person and a fourth person, and you of course you wouldn't set up zones if you were moving boxes. That would be silly. Oh, I'm not going to go beyond this zone because that's my balance. You know, you know, I'm I'm walking faster than you. Yeah. Um, so you can see how bucket brigade, you know, and they actually exist. Um, you know, in, in emergency situations or moving rocks or putting out fire 100 years ago, uh, that was essentially self-balancing. If someone was tired or stepped out of the line, the line would collapse on itself and keep moving. You wouldn't, you wouldn't even think about it. So self-balancing lines are essentially self-tuning in that way. Um, okay. They accommodate any natural variation of the speed of each worker. Okay. Now, if you're moving buckets, uh, then the work content that every person in that bucket brigade would need to know is essentially the same, right? Grab the bucket and move it down to yep. the next person. Uh, in, a, yep. in a production line, though, we have different work steps, different work content, et cetera. So um, how, how, is, how would the training be conducted for any of these? Sure. So, so back to our three-person assembly line, if you're, I'll say, um, operator one is at the front of the line, operator two is in the middle of the line, and operator three is at the end of the line who's finishing the part, essentially, right? So uh, you take a level-loaded line. Everyone has about one-third of the work content that they know and are cross-trained in. So to convert to a self-balancing line, now, again, you don't. nobody has to know the entire uh, start-to-finish work content. You would now need to know not necessarily one up and one down, but say an extra 10% up and an extra 10% down. So if you take anybody's entire work content at their station, now that probably consists of, let's say for the sake of discussion, you know, uh, 10 steps. Well, you would, you would need to know the first 10 steps or the last 10, last, oh, I'm sorry, the first three steps, for example, and the, and the last um, three steps, if you were um, either upstream or downstream of that person. So you just have to expand your cross-training, you know, plus or minus maybe 10%. The more you can do, the more overlap you have in cross-training, uh, the more um, seamless the self-balancing line is going to run. Because as the, the pull, which is initiated by the operator three finishing unit, when they walk up, so they finish a unit, now they don't have anything to work on, and there's no in-process queue in a self-balancing line, you walk upstream and pull from the upstream operator, and you take over their part, their tool, their station, whatever they're standing in front of, and you pull without waiting. That essentially is the self-balancing part of it. And you don't, you don't care where, what, where they're at, provided you are cross-trained in that, again, with the overlap. And you take over that part. Operator 2 walks upstream and pulls from operator 1. Operator one walks upstream and starts a new one, and then everyone works progressively at their own pace until the next poll happens. Okay. So, so picture this. If we're talking about a hypothetical three-person cell, a three-person line, mm -hmm. uh, if one person, say the middle person, needs to go to the restroom, or maybe they're, mm -hmm. just, not, maybe just, they're just not there today. Well, you're not going to get the sure. same output, right, with fewer people. But in terms of the self-balancing, uh, as long as people are cross-trained, that person at the end could complete a unit and then go upstream. And maybe there's not even anyone f at that middle station uh, permanently. Uh, so he, would, he or she would just keep on going upstream until he, he or she met that unit, right, at whatever stage it's at. And two people... Again, as long as they're sufficiently cross-trained, two people could cover that, what used to be a three-person line with, uh, without a hiccup, right, without any issues. Uh, absolutely. So say in that case, two people, like you each need to know at least 60, 65% of the line, you know, to have some overlap. If you each knew 50%, obviously you're back to a balanced line and there's, there's no overlap there. Um, but I also want to distinguish that in a three-person self-balancing line, there's not just three stations, or there's actually not stations at all. There's just what I call places to stand. So if, I, if I'm, again, one person progressing down the line, how many places are there to stand where someone else could stand next to me doing the, the, the upstream or downstream work? 
So with a three-person line, I, I instead of bouncing, there's a rule of thumb of three stations for every two people at, at a minimum. So you need additional places to stand. And again, you're, you're not in chairs, um, so you can be a little tighter. Um, but you'd have you know six, seven, um, five, six, seven different places to stand in a three-person line, or eight or nine. It, it's it's okay to have more. It would just allow you to add you know a fourth or fifth person if you had that. Um, increase demand. Okay, and, and just as an aside, the number of people you would actually need would come back to more, uh, say, traditional uh, industrial engineering kind of calculations, I believe, right? Yes, what's, what's, total, total cycle time divided by tax time. Right. You lean geeks out there. Um, right. Yeah, that's a starting point. Um, and again, like any good startup, you want you don't want to start, you know, not meeting production that first day, so you want to you know, err on the high side, um, and then observe, you know, kind of like a Kanban system. You can do all the calculations you want. Then you just got to observe it and adjust from there. Um, and often with self-balancing lines, as the kind of learning curve and handoffs get smoother, um, often they start going faster, and, and often it's, you're, you're pulling a person out of the line because uh, you're, you're, you're meeting, you're, you're running well below the tack time or, you know, meeting the day's production um, so a self-balancing line has the ability to improve over time, improve in, in terms of productivity, whereas uh, level load lines are tend to be fixed at a certain tack time. Uh, nothing wrong with that. I mean, of course, you know, nothing wrong with working for tack time, but um, there's no opportunity to improve productivity um, without throwing it out of balance in a level loaded line. Yeah, and, and I suppose, uh, depending on the, the company history, their standard, their times, their standard times uh, that maybe they're using to, to design this line uh, have built into them some of this inefficiency that won't be there in a self-balancing line that they've already baked into their times. Exactly. So, so self-balancing approximates, you know, true continuous flow as much as possible. The only time the part is not being worked on or added value is during the handoff, which often can be very brief. I've worked in other uh, industries with a with a, a higher tack time, you know, say a ten minute tack time, and they were working with fiber optic cable, for example, and you're kind of tangled in a spider web. Um, that handoff took a little while, but nonetheless, all the benefits of self balancing, productivity, uh, inventory reduction, um, flexibility far outweighed the little inefficiency of these cumbersome handoffs. Beautiful. I love it. So um, <laughs> the, um, you know, the approach we've been teaching, uh, again, we could, we could spend in, you know, a fair amount of time discussing that. Uh, but uh, I think the philosophy is the same, just the approach is a little bit different, but uh, we're big fans of it. But, but let me ask you this, uh, th through the many years that we've been preaching this concept of self-balancing or what we call flexing, uh, the, yep. the, the, the level of adoption by, by our clients or by the world in general that we've seen mm -hmm. has been mm -hmm. kind of disappointing. Because when you, when you tell someone that a 30% productivity gain is not that difficult, you know, within reach, you would think that people would be falling all over themselves to adopt it. Mm -hmm. But that's not really mm -hmm. the case. So I think it would be useful maybe to uh, share with the listeners your, your experience in convincing people and getting this approach actually adopted or... Or, or what, what is keeping people from uh, accepting this? That, that's a good question, um, and I learned this a long time ago. Actually, when I learned lean, this is what I learned, and I thought that's what lean was. Um, so I kind of grew up on a different island than most people. Yeah. Um, and so sharing it with other people and trying to, you know, help them convert their lines. Um, I, the consultant I learned it from, Jack Zimmerman, um, I worked with him for years as a mentor until I, you know, was comfortable on my own. And it, it's kind of the same uh, with clients. I've, you know, I take them through workshops or whatever. And unless you're making Subway subs or Chipotle burritos or something where it's pretty simple, the, the uh, skill level is low. Um, in, in, in any kind of complex manufacturing, I've, I've had, I think, the same um, problem you guys have had as they don't adopt it on their own, 
And it's not until they call me and, and really want that 30% or more productivity gain and they bring me in and, and, and I take them through it and we do one model line and they're off and running. I, I have some clients I can't say their name because it's a competitive advantage of what they do now. Sure. Um, one model line and they're off and running and they, and they got it. But that's that first one. I think when push comes to shove, people, I don't know, I don't know the psychology or maybe just like to go back to the little silo um, that's known. It's safe. You don't have to manage that um, person. Um, and self-balancing is a system. The whole thing is connected, and if it's not, if you're not pulling all the way through, um, you're not connected. And I think um, people may have a little challenge seeing how the how that whole thing can flow and connect and flow continuously. Um, they they I've, I've had some clients do half of the line and they get less than half of the benefit. For example, um, so so it's 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 it is a bit of a conundrum. But um, again, I didn't I I couldn't have done it by myself the first time. It took me a couple times with with my mentor. So um, and then once once you get the concept. Um, but there's often no going back. Yeah, because um, so. everything else is designing and waiting, designing in material handling steps of setting the part down just to pick it up by the next person. Um, you have all the, um, you know, someone doesn't show up, uh, it doesn't run, or oh, we improved the process. We took, you know, removed this, you know, ten percent. Well, great, it's just out of balance now. This person's more idle. Or we have to add this inspection step. Oh, great! Everything you do throws it out of balance. So, self-balancing just absorbs all that and accommodates that. So, um, but it, it really takes a first model line, I think. Well, maybe maybe this uh, discussion we're having will help inspire some of the listeners to to take the next step, right, and, and try it. And maybe this will help it get the word out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's 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 nice to have. Uh, option A, option you know, an iPhone or uh, iOS or Android. It's nice to have two options, you know, rather than just one. Um, you know, there's there's more than one way to balance a line, but if you don't know about something like self balancing, you'll always go to to the uh, you know the option A. You're right. Okay, Gordon. Well, uh, we're at a little over a half hour mark. Maybe that's a good time to wrap it up. Um, again, uh, your book's available on Amazon. Any other place they, they can find it or should look? Uh, Amazon, uh, Productivity Press, um, and, uh, yeah, uh, e either one's fine. Okay. And like I said, I tried it just before the call, so I went to Amazon. I typed in self-balancing under the book, under books. I got uh, the first two entries are like uh, scooters. <laughs> Uh, you know these little yeah scoot skateboard scooters, <laughs> <laughs> and then the third one on the list was uh, was Gordon's book. So that's where you can find it. Thank you again, Gordon. I look forward to uh, staying in touch and uh, maybe uh, doing this again on uh, related topics. All right, thanks, Richard. Okay, bye now.